Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Hanging on to Hope podcast. I'm Brenda J. And I'm Karen Wonder. And we are HangingOnToHope.org. This podcast is intended as educational and is not psychological or medical advice. Always consult a professional when needed, and we disclaim any liability in connection with the instruction, information, or advice given. Well, hi, everyone. On today's podcast, we have Dawn Hopkins. She was my yoga teacher trainer and is the founder and president of Inspiritus Yoga, Holistic Wellness and Training Centers, an international yoga school and wellness service provider. She is also co-author of Lemonade Stand 2, From Sour to Sweet, a book of inspirational stories from women. It's a great book. So welcome to the podcast, Dawn. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me onto your show. I'm really excited to be here. Yes, we're so glad for yes, you to be here. Yes, we are. So we're just going to start off with a question we thought, just one that we get encountered a lot. So we thought we would just, I had it weighed down on the questions. I thought I'll move that to the top because I think that's a, <laughs> an important question. And we went over it a lot, I know, extensively in, in our training and I thought it was really helpful. So the question is about how being a Christian and doing yoga, some people have, you know, issues with that. Can you share a little bit of background on that? I know you did that really well in our training. Oh, well, thank you. Well, it really kind of goes back to the word yoga. It originates from a root word, yuj, which means to join or or unite. So it's a practice that unites the body, mind, heart, and spirit but that spiritual component is unique to the practitioner. That's never like defined in the practice. It's unique to the person practicing. So Christ-centered yoga is essentially a full body worship experience that combines body, breath, prayer, meditation on scripture, inspirational or worship music. And from that sense, it's really, to me, encapsulating love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, really, because that's what the practice is all about, uniting those components. Right. So for me, I mean, to just tell you a little bit about how I got into it and what, what it means to me, I think that that sometimes helps illustrate something even better. I started taking yoga classes in 1997 in a traditional yoga studio, and it really was just kind of a way for me to recover my lost flexibility. I didn't like it at all. Really? <laughs> so not at all. Funny. So, but I kept going and it's just so funny how God's plans are. Right. But I was introduced to Christ centered yoga about like four or five years later. And I was practicing at mountain park church. Elena Porter leads a very large yoga ministry there. She started it about 20 years ago. So I think I started taking classes maybe a year in. And I had a profound spiritual experience that I I can't really describe other than to say that I really felt the Holy Spirit in my body. And I was emotionally a mess. I fell apart. I was crying. But what happened on that mat brought me into a deeper connection with God and I couldn't get enough of it. So I started attending regularly. I found that the practice really helped me to heal, to connect with myself, which I had a lot of disconnect due to previous trauma in my life, which we're going to talk about today. Um, And it also allowed me to connect to God in a deeper way because it was a whole body experience. It wasn't just prayer, you know, it combined all these other elements. And so I was given the opportunity to to go through training. And I went through training, not with the plans to teach. I just wanted more of that. I wanted more right. connection to God. What ended up happening is I wound up taking over for my instructor who went on maternity leave because no one else put their hand up. And so I said, okay, fine. I'll just teach until you get back. And I found that in preparing classes and then being a vessel and a vehicle to watch other people heal and connect in that way, it was like, it even multiplied the impact for me. And so I started teaching and then I started training and then I eventually developed my own yoga school and it totally changed the entire trajectory of my career and my life. So that's how important Christ-centered yoga is to me. <laughs> so, yeah. And also was Elena your original teacher? 
Yeah, she was one of my original teachers. Oh, that's mm-hmm. wild because she's great too. But you guys are both. I love both of your guys' style because it is. It's like I try to explain it to people. It's like a Bible study and do you know and you're stretching and you're in this relaxed state so it's like you're able to really take it in that's why i cry every time in your glass yeah Yeah, we call that tears in the ears and that's a good thing because (laughs) the body's releasing and healing and you know connecting in a deep way like that yeah yeah that's what when i went to previous churches there was always this debate with yoga in general but i've gone to your classes and i went to cornerstone church i went to some of your classes and that was my first experience with it it was great because the one time you had a worship leader there at like Christmas doing worship songs. So mm-hmm. it was totally just the Holy Spirit just fills you and it's just wonderful. And yeah, it, it was just a wonderful experience for me. So it's too bad that not everyone could just go and experience it just to see for themselves. I just kind of call it stretching because for me, it's stretching too. Mm-hmm. So that's how I look at it. So. I don't know. Yeah. That's my opinion on it all. <laughs> well, and I think some people have that conviction. And I feel like if, if that's their conviction, then don't do it. But I don't, yeah. when people try to tell you, you know, well, you're, you shouldn't do it. That's when it's like, no, now you're putting your conviction on me, which is called legalism. <laughs> but so, it's almost the same yeah. meditating. When I go meditate each day, I'm meditating on scripture. Mm-hmm. Right. So we're doing yoga and fil- being filled with the Holy Spirit and relaxing and God tells us in his in psalm 23 we lie down in green pastures he leads us beside quiet i just picture all those things when i'm doing that yoga with you Mm -hmm. and so yeah i mean and then we do we have mindfulness and we're just thanking god for the things around us so it's all like you said a mind soul body right experience and right wonderful and that's that's you just use the word right it's an experience it's not just a physical practice. I mean, it is something so much more than that. And over the years, I've come across lots of people who were maybe challenged by it because they don't know, they don't really fully understand what the practice is, or they somehow think it's a Hindu practice, which is, that's not entirely true. It's so unique to the practitioner and God knows our hearts. He sees our hearts. He knows the intention behind our practice. And in that way, there's never been a question for me. I knew exactly what my practice was about and is about and who I'm connecting to and what I experience in in my mind and my body and my heart and my spirit through the practice. And so for people who have been challenged in that way, I just invite them to come, like just come observe, watch, experience it so that you can get an understanding of what this practice really is about rather than having it based in misinformation or, you know, a lack of experience. And most of those people, when they come and they experience it, change their minds about it. So yeah, exactly. um, it's such a beautiful yeah. experience. I mean, it truly is beautiful. Going right. to your yoga. And then I went with my friend Nicole to the horse farm yoga a couple times because she went for breast cancer. It was like an event to raise for that. And from experience in years and then going to that one, I would just sit there and like praise God and just think about the creation that God made because we were out on a farm. And so I, I took what I, from your classes and Karen's led some classes with me before too. I took all that into all my experiences in the future. So you've mm-hmm. actually really helped me change my whole mindset on it. Oh, wow. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And I'm so glad that you mentioned breast cancer. I'm, I just went through my second uh, bout of breast cancer. And I will tell you that uh, so much fear arises and uncertainty and just everything that goes along with navigating a health journey like that. And uh, if, if not for yoga, I think I would have completely unraveled. <laughs> I would have uh, given way to my fear. And, you know, our body can't be in a healing state when we're at war with our own flesh and we're in that space of fear. And so it helped me to really navigate that journey with grace and ease and trust, you know, trusting God and, and remaining grounded and centered throughout. And it was such an integral part of that for me. Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah, it is. Your first marriage was not a happy marriage, but you are now happily married. So it gives us single ladies hope. Can you share a little more about your background? Yeah, well, first of all, in full disclosure, that was actually my second marriage. (laughs) And so I was married for a very short time. 
fresh out of grad school. And my first husband left me for an old girlfriend less than two years into our marriage. So about five years later, I married again. My ex was a part owner of a bar and restaurant. He had two children who had a tremendous amount of emotional problems and both later were diagnosed with mental illness. Their mother was a drug addict and they had been through a lot of trauma. Um, Yeah. So my ex was, he was very charismatic and could be very, very loving, but he also had a very dark side that would come out from time to time. He also was married to the bar and the lifestyle of the bar. So a lot of issues went along with that, but our marriage lasted about 14 years. We had two children together who are now 18 and 21 years old. That's just crazy to think about that. But I think I was trying to keep the family together. I stayed much longer maybe than I would have because I felt so badly for my stepchildren. And I knew that if we were divorced, they would suffer even more, which is exactly what happened. But all that to say, I met my current husband, Bob at Mountain Park Church where I was teaching yoga and I was part of women's ministry. God's hand was all over it. My kids knew him before I did. He and his wife worked in children's ministry. So my kids knew him as Mr. Bob and Mrs. Sandy. His best friend brought him to my yoga class and we became friends. When his wife, Sandy, became sick with ovarian cancer, I connected him to what I call my cancer club. I had a bunch of people in my classes who had navigated cancer in some way, shape or form. And so I connected them and this group really helped them with support and prayer. We brought meals to them and helped provided massage and things like that to Sandy. We became close enough that they knew what was happening in my marriage. And they in turn provided counsel and support to me while I was navigating the end of my marriage and then ultimately my divorce. So my marriage ended in March of 2013. Sandy died in September just months later. Shortly after that, Bob's daughter had an emotional breakdown. She was cutting and suicidal. And I was kind of brought in to help them navigate that because I had gone through that myself. So at the time, I owned a nonprofit Christ-centered wellness studio. And we ended up scholarshipping Bob to come back because he really desperately needed it. He did. And then over time, our relationship grew and evolved and changed. And uh, we had our first date on St. Patrick's Day of 2014. So that was just, that we just celebrated that two days ago. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, the rest is history, so to speak, right? We just knew right away we we had been friends for so long. We had navigated a lot together as friends. And so we ended up getting married on June 28th, 2015. That's awesome. Yeah. So I learned things about you that I did not know when I read your story in that book, The Lemonade Stand. Like you, you kind of just previously mentioned that, that you had previously had had abusive relationships and that when you were in college, it was so devastating that you tried to take your own life. And so you shared that you had a near death experience. And I would love to hear you share more about that. Yeah. I was 20 years old at the time and I had experienced a tremendous amount of trauma growing up in a very dysfunctional family. Um, I ended up getting involved with an older boy when I was 17 and he was bipolar had an alcohol problem and also had come from a family of abuse. He was very attractive and charming and he lavished me with all kinds of attention. However, he had a violent side to him and he would get violent at times when he got went low. I believe the the bipolar spectrum, you know, when he was in that low state or when he got really jealous, there'd be outbursts. And so There was a night, actually Father's Day, 1989, and it was the last time he hit me. And he had left and I tried to kill myself. He came back and found me. And thank God he called 911. I so believe that this was God's protection over my life. So I was rushed to the emergency room and I coded twice due to blood loss. The doctors prepared my parents for me to die. They also prepared my parents that if I did live, I might lose one or both of my legs. But after seven pints of blood and emergency surgery, I was saved. During the surgery, I had an out-of-body experience. I went up into the upper left-hand corner of the room, and I could observe everything that was happening around me. In fact, 
I could recall different things that were said in the operating room that, you know, nobody understood why I knew, but I was literally watching it all happen. I was wrapped up in love and light and peace. And I wanted to tell everybody that everything was going to be okay. I didn't know what that meant. You know, I didn't know if I was going to die or not die. I had no idea. I just remember thinking that I was experiencing so much peace that everything was going to be just fine. And then when I came to, I woke up in my bed and had legs. And Mm -hmm. I remember the doctor at the end of the bed coming in to visit me and my parents were there. And he said that I was a medical miracle. And then he stopped himself in the middle of saying medical miracle. And he said, no, she is just a miracle. And Uh that was where my walk with God began. Because Uh at that point in my life, I had thrown my faith out the window. I was calling myself an atheist. I was probably more agnostic or I was just a believer who was really discouraged because of everything I had been through. I don't know. But if you had your death experience, you weren't a Christian. I was not. Oh, no. okay. No. Wow. Mm-hmm. wow. Yeah. So that's where my walk with God began. And then it took time. I felt the connection, but I didn't, I was kind of turned off by Christianity because of what I had experienced. My parents called themselves Christians and I witnessed so many things that were so counter to Christianity. And I felt that they were hypocritical. And because of my relationship with my parents, I probably projected that onto God at the time and just thought he must be a very cruel, unloving God. Mm -hmm. And I don't want any part of that. Yeah. By the time I was like a sophomore in college, I guess I was probably at that time. I just didn't want any part of it. And then I had this near death experience, which made me realize like there is a God and he loves me and he's not done with me yet. And then it took me a number of years before I re-entered Christianity, I should say, but with a very different perspective. And then over time, through the practice of Christ-centered yoga, I started to understand what it was like to literally walk with Christ and be in relationship with Christ. And I fell in love with Christ on a yoga mat. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. so beautiful. Oh, God works, you know, with people in so many different ways, like he worked with you in that way. That's, that's beautiful. You know what I love about what you say about your near death experience was, you know, all the ones I've read about, which I've read about a lot, they talk about that unexplainable love that they felt. Mm -hmm. What I love about what you talk about is that peace. Yes. Along with the love. Because I feel yeah. that all the time and I can't explain why his presence allows me to feel that peace. But I yeah. love that. I, I really love that. So hopefully. Well, and, and to think like, how could I be feeling peace when I'm, you know, watching these people mm-hmm. scrambling yeah. to keep me alive in an emergency situation and my body is literally hanging on to life. And I felt this peace, like what? That doesn't make sense, uh, right? That is a and peace that's surpasses understanding. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Wow. What did your parents think of all of that? I don't know that they fully understand it. It's hard enough to explain a near death experience to somebody. And it's a whole other thing to, to have such a shift in faith to go from being a non Christian atheist or whatever I, I define myself as. I don't know that I ever put words around it to fall in love with Christ. It's only, it can only be God. Yeah. But I think that at the time my parents didn't, they were just glad that I was alive. And I think yeah. that they attributed it to medical science. I don't think that they really understood what all happened in that situation. They didn't understand um, the natural part yeah. of it. Yeah. Mm, wow. I love that because I've read about other experiences where that person wasn't necessarily a Christian and I get really, really jealous when other people get to have those experiences with God. Those really good though that and all the ones that I've noticed that those people do end up having a really strong relationship with God after their near death experience, even if they weren't at the time. So he's just mm-hmm. giving them a little glimpse of himself. Or was it a big glimpse? Was it a small glimpse or a big glimpse? Like, how do you feel like with your experience? It it was a profound shift. It was a big shift for me. And it was, I, I mean, literally, I had gone back into this relationship so many times. When I got done with therapy, I mean, I, I was hospitalized for physical reasons, but then for my mental, emotional, you know, reasons, I never wanted to 
see that guy again. <laughs> I mean, I was mm-hmm. done, done. And I also moved out of my parents' house and never went back because of what was happening in my family of origin and how unhealthy that was. So God gave me the strength to leave some very, you know, very difficult circumstances. And, wow. and I'm thinking here, I was at 20 years old. I never moved back in with my parents ever again. I never lived with them again after that. So, you know, it set me on a very different journey of healing and faith than I would ever have anticipated. And certainly apart from this incident may never have happened. Uh So when people like apologize to me for what I went through, I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. This was the best thing that could have happened to me because of how it brought me back to God. It, It helped me to understand the power that God has, how loving he is, how healing he is. And it enabled me to start to move forward in a different direction with my life. Although clearly there was still a lot to unravel because I ended up in a marriage for 14 years that still had some yeah. violence and and still kind of mirrored some of the things that I had been through in my life prior. But I think that unraveling from trauma and unraveling from dysfunctional relationships, it can take a lifetime. Right. And, uh-huh. you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And so, right. but that's where it began for me, if that makes sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And that makes sense. I mean, God has already used you. Like you said, you you end up helping Bob's daughter, right? Mm-hmm. That's, I mean, it's just amazing how God will use what you've been through like that then to, to help other people. Yeah. And that experience, it just showed God loves you so much that he showed you how to heal and just steered you away from toxicity in your right. life so that you could have the healing that you needed. He loves us so much that he doesn't want us to be abused. He doesn't mm-hmm. want us to be mistreated. And he doesn't even want us around that. It's like what yeah. it's showing me. So yeah. yeah. Well, I always say that our misery can become our ministry. Mm. And that is what happened for me is he, it's that beauty from ashes where, yeah. right. you know, he takes the ugly, the pain, the misery of our life and he can make something beautiful from it. And oftentimes that beauty comes when we start to then go into ministry and help other people like us or right. help other people with their healing from their trauma and help them connect to God and, and understand the power that God has to help facilitate healing. Beautiful. So, yeah, but it all is, it was born of that pain and that misery. That's awesome. That's, yeah, that's the whole reason we have the podcast is because of what we've been through and wanting to help other people have healing. And then it's also why I'm drawn to yoga. And now I'm really focusing on the psoas because there's so much, I mean, I, I've just gotten so much just the time I've been doing it, how you can help people, you know, release their body from trauma because everyone does have trauma. So I'm getting ahead of myself though. <laughs> but, um, so you are my favorite, my all time favorite yoga teacher. I love your Aww. classes. I think we have the same taste in music. So I love how you're, I just love your, you know, the music that you choose. And then the message is so, like I said, I'm just so relaxed when I do your classes that I just, I always, I just always feel so, I come out just feeling like I've just been kissed by God, you know, and I'm, and I've had a good, stretching on my body. So it's just such a win-win. So on the final, my final project, when I went through the teacher training was I studied the effects of um, trauma and yoga. And I, I found that that's where I really started seeing the connection and how much yoga can help with trauma. There's so much evidence in that, that it calms our nervous system. It gets us in rest and digest mode so we can truly thrive. And in the book, the wonderful book, The Body Keeps the Score, which I read when I was going through that teacher training by Besser Van Der Kolk, Trauma victims cannot recover until they become familiar with and befriend the sensations in their bodies. Being frightened means that you live in a body that is aware and is always on guard. Angry people live in angry bodies. In order to change, people need to become aware of their sensations and the way their bodies interact with the world around them. Physical self-awareness is the first step in releasing the tyranny of the past. That's a quote from his book. So in your classes, I think I cried every time because of just feeling so relaxed, like I was saying, and just feeling, I really felt, you know, that connection and just really was able to take in God's love a little deeper through your classes and, you know, as you would share scripture. So anything that you would want to add to the importance of yoga and dealing with trauma? Well, like the book speaks about the body keeps the score. The body remembers trauma. It leaves an imprint, right? So the way to heal trauma is to get into the body. The other thing about this is that energy is 
constantly in motion and emotions literally are that energy in motion and they're looking for a way out. So one of the things about yoga is that it enables the body to have a vehicle to release trauma, to release held emotions. So through conscious movement, creating calm through breath work, practices like trauma release, which can help to rewire the brain, yoga nidra, and other forms of meditation. And then I would say the spiritual practices of yoga in general really can help us heal trauma at the source, you know, and resolve it from the source. So what I think you're experiencing every time you're on your mat is just that, right? The crying is the release of energy. It's release of emotion. The fact that you feel calmer and you feel so relaxed has to do with the fact that these practices help the body come out of that fight or flight state, that state of fear and stress into a state of calm and the relaxation response in the body. So very, very important in order for the body to heal. But then we have these practices like, you know, psoas release or, you know, trauma release that literally helps to rewire the brain because we trauma creates these neural nets, you know, these, these connections in the brain and practices like psoas release help us to detach it's like a lock and a key, pull that key out so that the brain can form new connections in that way, lower the effect of the triggers or even resolve the triggers altogether. Right. And in our brain podcast, she even said that it will help shrink the amygdala. It does. Yeah. And create new, new neural pathways. New neural pathways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. <sighs> Uh, Vander Kolk says nobody can treat a war or abuse, rape, molestation, or any other horrendous event for that matter. What has happened cannot be undone, but what can be dealt with are the imprints of trauma on the body, mind, and soul. The crushing sensations in your chest that you may label as anxiety or depression, the fear of losing control, always being on alert for danger or rejection, the self-loathing, the nightmares and flashbacks, the fog that keeps you from staying on task and from engaging fully in what you are doing, being unable to fully open your heart to another human being. The pathway to recovery is a soul-mind-body connection. Where's a good place for someone new to yoga to start? Wow, anywhere, really. Yoga meets us where we are. So whether it's just through breathwork practices, mindfulness practices, meditation, yoga, in terms of the physical postures or the physical practice of yoga, there's something for everyone. So there's so many different styles of yoga, different levels of yoga. And it took me many years to (laughs) like yoga, as I mentioned previously, right? And to find a practice that resonated for me. So my advice would be that if you, you know, don't like one type or you don't connect initially, keep trying until you find something that works for you and then keep going. (laughs) Because I believe the effects are cumulative over time. And it's just like anything, the more we practice something consistently, the more that becomes the new norm for our body, right? So you were talking about the effects of trauma and the imprint that it leaves, the body in a state of trauma doesn't feel comfortable in a space of being calm, because it's in that hypervigilant state, it's trying to protect, right? Mm -hmm. So practices, like I mentioned, help to create and cultivate a sense of calm and make that the norm. Whereas, you know, when we're dealing with trauma, that feels so uncomfortable, because it feels like we are vulnerable, right? We're, We're calm and vulnerable. So making that feel like the natural state, once again, which is, you know, how we're designed starts to create a new experience. And then we go, Oh, okay. Nothing bad happened to me when I was calm and relaxed. (laughs) Right. I think that's what we think is going to happen. Like something bad is going to happen if we like let down our guard and we're calm and relaxed. So creating calm is the new normal. And again, all the other benefits that I mentioned, but for, for someone to start, just start, start anywhere, whether you start with trying different breathing techniques, or you try meditation, or you go to a yoga class, or you try some, you know, mindfulness practices, things like that, that's going to be the key to helping create a new platform of calm within the body and the mind. Yeah, and we all need yeah. calm, we all need more calm. With yeah, everything that's amazing. That we're going through. Yeah, because I spent like the last 18 months, not doing yoga the whole time, but doing 
things that were calming to my entire life. And now I mm-hmm. notice when stress gets ba- introduced back in, it's not my new normal. I don't yeah. want that. So that's really neat how it's rejecting that because my mm-hmm. new normal is calm. Like I just crave calm. Now when I'm down, I'm at the gym or I'm out, you know, meditating or running or whatever, you know, just anything that calms my body is what my normal is now. So, yeah. Isn't that amazing? You just illustrated my point. I love that, Brenda. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. yeah. So the last quote from the Body Keeps the Score book is traumatized people are often afraid of feeling, kind of like you were saying. It is not so much the perpetrators who hopefully are no longer around to hurt them, but their own physical sensations that are now the enemy. Apprehension about being hijacked or uncomfortable sensations keeps the body frozen and the mind shut. So I started doing yoga after I was separated because it was forbidden because it was, again, like what we talked about before. Um, it was just seen as something bad and like a Middle Eastern thing that I shouldn't get involved with. So as soon as I was separated, I, I started, I Googled on YouTube and I found this yoga routine, which I still do to this day because it was a TMJ one because I, you know, I grind my teeth at night and I've been doing the same TMJ before I go to bed. I mean, there are, there are nights I don't do it and then I have pain <laughs> in the morning because I, I really believe in it. She just has you kind of focus on, you know, relaxing your jaw and just doing that. So that's what kind of got me into it. And then I remember I met you for coffee because uh, my coworker had gone through your training and um, she was telling me about it because she's not a Christian. She goes, she, you'd really like her because it's Christian, <laughs> you know? So I remember meeting you for coffee and we just connected and I'm like, no, I think I really want to take this training. And it was mainly just so, you know, like you were saying to make my own practice better, but now I, I want to kind of go further and I really want to, I've seen so many benefits, especially since I've been focusing on the psoas because I really do notice this. I can't even explain. It. I was trying to explain to my son. I'm like, it's just like, I feel more present. Present. I feel there's just something I can't even explain from doing that, doing the SOAS classes regularly. So can you share more about your experience on gentle yoga, restorative yoga, yoga nidra that can help open the mind? You kind of really talked about this a little bit, but can help open the mind and body to relax and restore. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned TMJ because that is very much connected to, you know, that fight or flight response because it causes the jaw to tense and tighten. You know, we might clench our teeth or grind our teeth. Um, but it also <laughs> I'm rubbing my jaw right now, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but it creates tension in the neck and the shoulders and the hips and the low back, you know? And so um, it's interesting to note that. Um, so there's the whole new field called um, polyvagal theory. That's uh, it's relatively new, but it, it looks at the fight or flight response a little bit differently. And so previously we always thought that it was like the, sympathetic nervous system, that's that fight or flight response. And then the parasympathetic nervous system is where we're in that space of rest, digest, and where the body goes back to homeostasis. Well, polyvagal theory now proposes that there's like three different neural platforms. And so we have the fight or flight response, which is taking place in the sympathetic nervous system. Then we have our vagus nerve, which has two branches, one that goes down the backside of the body, which is called the dorsal vagal nervous system. And then the one that goes down the front of the body, which is called the ventral vagal nervous system. And both of them are part of the parasympathetic nervous system. So the freeze response, like when we just are like deer in the headlights, or we're almost like playing dead, you know, like you kind of think of like a lizard, like when they get scared, they just freeze and they look like they're dead. Um, That's that dorsal vagal platform. And then the rest and digest nervous system and where the body can connect to where we can connect internally, but then we can connect with others and we connect spiritually. That's all taking place in the ventral vagal nervous system. It goes down the front side of the body. So the practices that you're talking about help to tonify the ventral vagal nervous system so that it counters the effects of stress and trauma on the body so that the body, you know, is in that rest and digest state and can be in a space of connection. So these practices that you mentioned help to facilitate calm and a peaceful presence. They are deeply healing and restorative for the body, the mind, and the spirit. They help to release tension, both physical tension and or mental emotional tension. They help to reduce anxiety, improve mood, again, facilitate calm, help us to reconnect. And remember that when we've gone through trauma, we disconnect right? We disconnect Mm -hmm. from various parts of our help us to reconnect in our wholeness, which God designed us to be whole, right? And then so much more so that, you know, it will counter the effects of stress and trauma on the body. Yeah. And I love it. Like you say it a lot. And I know this teacher that I was listening to the TMJ when she'd always say, 
relax your jaw. <laughs> and I'm like, thank you. Cause I, I needed that. I needed it because every time I go to stretch, it'd be like, I didn't even realize I was doing it. So I needed mm-hmm. to be reminded that like every, every minute almost. Oh, that, right? that was a really, what you just talked about was fascinating to me. Yeah. I want to read more about that. I, I, I know you read, you got into that with the psoas and I, I love it. It's hard to understand, but I really want to learn that more because it's fascinating. Oh, I just hadn't heard anyone talk about that yet. Cause I, I just love that. Now everything makes more sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's yeah. a there's a great book called Polyvagal Theory in Therapy by Deb Dana D A N A that talks about all of this. Okay, so, yeah, I get that. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, here are just some of the benefits of yoga on the body. Internal organs are massaged, nerves are toned, respiration, energy, and vitality are restored. The mind relaxes and anxieties are released. Self acceptance is encouraged. The body is purified from the inside. Any other benefits you can share that will encourage our listeners to give yoga a try? Oh, wow. To be continued. Stay tuned for next week's part two with Don Hopkins. You don't want to miss it. Thanks for tuning in to Hanging On To Hope. Check out our website, hangingontohope.org. There are resources on there. And if you would like to donate or volunteer, you can do that through our website. We are a brand new nonprofit, so we appreciate any and all support. And we thank you for listening. And until next time, keep hanging on to hope. We are evidence that there is hope and healing for you. And our passion is to help you find it too. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening, everyone.